for everybody for joining this evening. Uh, please can we go to the next slide, Lisa? So an exciting slide here, a, a short legal disclaimer with forward-looking statements. Uh, please can you take a little bit of time after this to have a, uh, have a look through. Okay, so eTherapeutics, uh, Oxford UK-based uh, listed company on A. We are a network-driven computational drug discovery platform, and you'll be hearing a lot about the concept of network throughout my presentation. And uh, I made a slight change to this slide, but in, in effect, what do we do? We address the critical question of translatability in drug discovery and drug development, uh, which is to say, we have a set of technologies and a platform which tries to avoid or even resolve uh, very expensive and often very late stage drug failure due to a lack of efficacy. So what are some of the uh, challenges in the uh, drug discovery uh, process? Uh, and I guess a good starting point would be that the whole problem of translatability starts first and foremost with, you know, you want an early and robust assay system which can predict uh, the response of your compound in man. Uh, and the problems uh, start that standard early screening assays, you know, poor predictors of clinical response. Uh, the type of assays that we use, so-called phenotypic assays, uh, are, are more complex. They try and keep a, a capture a piece of biology. They're being adopted more and more uh, by the pharmaceutical industry. They have very good translatability, but suffer uh, from a, a very bad, um, uh, inefficient system. So I'm going to give you an example of. Um, uh, a phenotypic assay in the, in the context of COVID-19. A very simple phenotypic assay would be to set up uh, an assay of uh, lung cell lines uh, induced with the COVID virus. Uh, what you might be looking for from that assay is to test compounds, maybe antiviral compounds, to see if you can uh, produce the viral load. Uh, in terms of the complexity on the far right, uh, you can see some, um, some pretty large numbers in, in Typical pharmaceutical process in a blind phenotype skipping process, you know, up to 200,000, even more compounds can be tested uh, against their phenotypic uh, assay of their choice. Um, and aside from the very you know, large volume of compounds and, and the restrictions that, that brings with it, um, the, the number of hits and a definition of a hit is, is a compound which has had a meaningful impact on your phenotype that you're looking for. Uh, we're talking very, very small numbers. Uh, very small can range from zero to, you know, as small as 0.1%, and those are the sort of ranges in terms of, you know, outputs, meaningful outputs from a very, very large starting screening base. Uh, on top of the very poor hit ratio, we also have a problem that even if you do find an active compound against your assay, you have no mechanistic information or really any idea why you may have reduced the viral load in that particular setting. Uh, as I said earlier, we have over many years discovered a, a platform technology to try and resolve and even solve some of these issues. Um, you can look on the left hand side of this slide, and as inputs uh, to our platform really consist of a set of databases. Uh, there can be, as I've described here, protein to protein interaction databases, compound protein by activity, uh, genome wide association study, even literature and known biology. Uh, you know, we have a lot of e uh, Right for and even, uh, even even public information uh, can be very useful for us, um, and they act as inputs into our core e-therapeutics platform, which we like to sort of call a, a man plus machine collaboration. On the machine side, uh, you can think about um, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence algorithms, which try and curate and augment the data sets for our needs or a particular project uh, we're working for. Uh, but we also need and use uh, highly skilled uh, computational molecular biologists to ultimately derive our outputs, which really are new and better drugs, me uh, methods of action insights, and, and target nomination. But I'll go into a little bit more granularity into those. So, what is network biology and the concept of networks? What does it sit with our uh, view, world view of biology? Uh, on the left hand side, you can see a very simplified example of a biological process within a cell where proteins, these proteins are represented by nodes or the circles that you see in colors. They interact and are actually connected with each other to, to, to form a network. So the process in question there is really a network of proteins. And on the right hand side is a slightly more convoluted, but is, is a version of, a, of an in silico um, mimicking the network and the protein interactivity that you see on the left hand side. 
So just to remember, within a cell, there are you know, literally thousands of cellular processes, all of which can be uh, modeled by our systems. And this is just a prototype of one particular cellular process. So by modeling as closely as we can uh, biological systems uh, you know, as it is, we increase the likelihood of identifying and develop, really developing the best effective therapies. Uh, so this is our core product, it's called Network Driven Drug Discovery, NDD, and I think I'm going to go through a COVID-19 uh, case study uh, approach to go through the individual processes. This slide is a high-level schematic of the NDD process, where we can go from hypothesis uh, to testing a compound really in a matter of months. Uh, on the top left with a light bulb, you start with an indication of interest, in, as I said, COVID-19 in this case. But really what we're interested in is uh, a disease process within within that uh, within that indication within COVID-19. So I've chosen one which is of particular interest uh, and particularly deadly, which is a hyperinflammatory response, which some patients seem to get at, at, with COVID-19 for the cytokine storm. Uh, I'm going to go through this at a very high level and zoom in to the you know each of the constructions that you can see in the pink here. But once we've chosen a disease process, call it a cytokine storm. Uh, step two is really we go into our in silico discovery engine and we create a, a network model of a cytokine storm. So the best representation that we can of the interacting proteins and their connectivity which represents a, a cytokine storm. These networks, and there are many networks that are iterated and, and, and refined, refined, refined and analyzed, uh, ultimately lead to our compound database which really tries to find uh, the most potent compounds to disrupt this uh, network, which again, I want to remind you, is a, is a model of a cytokine storm. And the disruption of the network is a very important concept, and there are some nuances to that, which I think you'll see it in, in the next slides. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see uh, what I've called a wet lab, wet lab testing. So, you know, there's a lot of hype and, and, and talk about uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning and drug discovery and drug development. There's no question that uh, we are extensive users of it and uh, computational power and, and, and big data, uh, but I've already admitted to uh, uh, the use of uh, um, uh, you know, highly skilled molecular biologists and computational biologists, all of which I'm always trying to, uh, in a nice way, get rid of, but they're fighting hard. Uh, my point being that we can't fully automate this process and no one can, uh, and actually what we find with our partners is information enough is not enough to cross them over the line. Uh, they like to basically translate information to a physical compound. And as you can see on the right-hand side, we in effect take our findings from the discovery engine and go into the phenotypic, the traditional phenotypic screening process that I showed in a, a few slides. So uh, zooming in again into one of the, the pink boxes and the processes to try and really sort of just give a good idea of what we actually do almost on a daily basis. So this slide divided into two components. Um, on the left-hand side is our best representation of the protein interactions and the network effect of the cytokine storm um, within COVID-19. Um, and on the right-hand side is a representation of our database of something like 15 million small molecules of the compound. Uh, and, and, and the idea being here, remember, is that if this network here is really a true and fair reflection of a cytokine storm, I've used the word disrupt at the top. Um, disrupting it would be nice. Um, I think probably in the context of a cytokine storm, we'd like to destroy it and crush it. Uh, the, the hypothesis being if that really is a model of a cytokine storm. And if we can find compounds on the right-hand side, which can disrupt it, let's say, um, or, or, or completely dismantle it, then at least in silico, we've proven that we found compounds that can basically have uh, an effect in a cytokine storm. Uh, importantly, on the right-hand side, the 15 million compound database is incomplete, incomplete in the, in the sense that there's only so much knowledge of compounds um, against proteins. So some, some of the database has no knowledge of uh, protein footprints or binding activity, but there's a lot of the um, database that requires, again, machine learning and artificial intelligence to predict which compounds have the best activity uh, against this particular network or any network. Uh, and the last point I'd make about this network, um, so biological networks uh, are extremely resistant to attack, uh, even, in a, even in a disease setting. Uh, so where you attack them uh, is 
particularly important and try and disrupt them. So here I've highlighted in big red circles, uh, which are optimal locations to try and disrupt this network. Um, we'll see a good example of what disruption is in the next slide. And in the blue ones, uh, are probably more suboptimal um, areas of attack. Um, if you want to translate that to a real life scenario, you can think of some drug failures as um, you know, molecules which are really attacking a biological process, They're not on their Achilles heel, not really trying to disrupt the process, or not really having, a, having any kind of efficacy uh, against the process. So the system is just much more robust. Whereas if you attack it in, its, uh, in the right locations, uh, and in, the, in this kind of Achilles heel, you will disrupt it uh, in a much more meaningful way. Okay, I hope these short, very five second short videos uh, work. Uh, the next stage of, of, of upper network construction and, 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 and the compound mapping is on the left hand side, you can see a video of compound A on a, on a particular network. Uh, as you can see, we've attacked a certain node and the protein, but the network at the end of the five second clip seems very intact. There are a few networks around, this, uh, a few nodes around or proteins around the side which seem to be uh, dismantled. And the effect of compound B, which is attacking the correct location, if you like, some of the Achilles heels of the network, um, shows a dramatically different effect, and that's the effect you're looking for. So again, if this is a representation of a cytokine storm, and you've got the right compounds attacking the right node in its most vulnerable parts of that biological system, you can be sure that this compound is going to have good activity. Uh, so what that translates to on the right-hand side is uh, you know, through a power of process of iteration and, and variety and a lot of different networks and permutations and combinations, the ultimate list of compounds that we come up with is something like 200 to 1,000 compounds. So if you compare that to my beginning slide where blind phenotypic screening was 200,000, and that was even an estimation, you can go up to even a million compounds, we can select 200 to 1,000 compounds uh, and not only that, uh, in terms of the uh, you know, very select and, and small nature of them, we know that they have very potent activity uh, uh, against the network. Uh, and if our modeling is right, these, uh, these compounds are going to be highly active. Okay, so I, I wanted to give a reminder because I think it's still, it's, a, it's, an, it's an important USB of our NDD product. Um, again, uh, we've just left the in silico part. We've, hopefully uh, found the best 200 to 1,000 compounds and the best network models of a cytokine storm. We found the best compounds which disrupt this process um, as aggressively as possible. Uh, and I wanted to point out that at this point, we, we really do actually physically get these compounds synthesized. We ship them to our partners, um, and our partners have their phenotypic assays set up. Uh, another point to consider is these phenotypic assays are very bespoke. Um, you know, a lot of large pharmaceutical companies are spending a lot of money um, as their key de-risking step in the drug discovery, drug development process. So, uh, you know, they, they, they give a lot of uh, credence to what comes out of these phenotypic uh, screens. So the 200 to 1,000 compounds are shipped, tested in their, uh, in their phenotypic assays, uh, and the um, resultant output, and really, if you like, the score, if you really want to think of it that way, from this entire, you know, relatively complex set of um, maneuvers is that, uh, you know, what is your hit rate um, in these phenotypic screens? How have you altered the phenotypes that your uh, partner is looking for? And if you go to the next slide, I think you'll see quite a dramatic difference to the very beginning slides. Okay, so on the left-hand side, um, these are various biological processes and projects that we've worked on. At the bottom, you'll see two collaborations with Novo Nordisk and uh, MSD. Uh, and on the right-hand side, you can see the kind of dramatic difference in, in, in two areas to the very first slide. One is what I've described in the pro, you know, around, we can produce compound lists of around 1,000 as opposed to 200,000 or more um, in a kind of traditional approach. But more importantly than that, our hit ratios are you know, something like a hundred to a thousand times higher than uh, industry standards. Um, so, you know, we're, we're addressing a, a very real need. Uh, and we're saving a lot of time, a lot of cost. Um, we need to test, obviously, far fewer com uh, compounds to find high-quality hits. We improve the translatability by enabling use of 
even more relevant phenotypic assays. So some phenotypic assays cannot absorb, but there aren't enough high throughput screening uh, robotics to do 200,000 compounds. Uh, the more sophisticated your assay, the less compounds you can test. So, you know, the number of compounds we can basically ship, which have hits, can really start working in much more relevant assays. Uh, and importantly, after all this, even the number of compounds in the hits, our hits are not blind. Because obviously, remember, we've gone through the entire uh, informatics process and we have information on their potential mode of action, which a blind phenotypic screen does not do. Our second uh, younger product that uh, I've got to say one that is really uh, catching people's imagination because I think again it is it's addressing a, a real need in, in, in the market is a genomics uh, genomics informatic platform called GAINS Genome Association Interaction Networks. Uh, so the input uh, uh, for this is uh, is a GWAT, a genome wide association studies which have been you know, very successful in certain ways at, at generating a lot of data, DNA sequencing data. In, if you like, near monogenic or if you like simple diseases, there's been some dramatic findings using GWAS. But where GWAS has not delivered at all, and when there is a real unmet need in terms of action or other insights, is in very complex diseases. Uh, and in very simple terms, take a complex disease like diabetes, um, you will in a diabetes GWAS study find something in the region of 100 gene variants um, in a population um, and then you'll have the problem that these variants each of them will have a very small effect size so no one or even small cluster of variants will have an effect size which can point you to a certain place in the genome to start um, thinking about a drug intervention um, so you know the variants are, are very weak in their effect uh, and ultimately these sort of complex disease GWAS is can generate something in the region of lists of 200 genes which may or may not be causal in a very complex disease like diabetes and obviously that's almost impossible to, to, to action. So, so our gains approach puts GWAS findings again using uh, our network uh, approach into a network context. Um, so we can go from uh, these very weak variants, uh, the 200 gene list, and we can take the 200 gene lists and using our informatics platforms, we can um, zoom in, uh, the next stage being finding very important biological processes, such as maybe inflammation. Um, from high level biological processes, we can then find um, pathways, uh, which are particularly important, uh, potentially in diabetes or, or other complex diseases. Um, from a pathway, uh, it's possible to actually go back into an NDD project and generate the compound using the, the kind of set of processes I discussed earlier. Or you can even zoom in further from pathways into targets to more targeted therapies such as RNAi, CRISPR, thin finger nucleases, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the point being that the network construction allows uh, really a set of impossible set of information to be actionable uh, for a drug intervention. So this slide is, uh, is a little bit hard to read, but the key takeaway, then, something that impressed me when I first saw it, is uh, the type of sort of dramatic findings you can find from games, uh, kind of exemplified in a study we did in Parkinson. Uh, at the moment, we have a project running with Novo Nordisk and diabetes. We've done a, a collaboration in Parkinson's with C4X. Uh, we've currently got two other pilot projects in complex diseases using games going. But in the Parkinson's study, obviously Parkinson is a very complex disease. Um, you know, lots of variants, very difficult to map onto any particular gene. Um, so our study of Parkinson's uh, found two uh, very highly ranked, uh, one very highly ranked process, one was inflammation. You could sort of say that's reasonably well known, but it was very highly ranked. And we zoomed in and actually found that the TNF alpha pathway was very highly ranked in our network analysis. Now, kind of unbeknownst to us at this time, literally a few weeks later, a seminal paper on Parkinson's came out uh, that said that patients who are taking anti-TNF-alpha, which is the pathway that we found, so anti-TNF-alpha is a, is a drug modality, 80% uh, likely to develop Parkinson's. So that sort of linkage um, all the way from you know, sequencing variants, gene lists, to finding those types of high-level processes, to finding that type of pathway, and then having validated that in the end, obviously, prospectively, shows uh, that you know we're, we're, our analysis.
analysis, our informatics analysis is, is starting to home in and zone in on real actionable um, areas of biology and genomics. Okay, so in summary, we address the critical efficiency and translatability challenges of drug discovery. Uh, importantly, we are disease area agnostic and we have a very scalable business model. We think about um, the number of indications and more importantly, the number of biological processes within those indications that we could address uh, uh, and we could model and whether it's an NDD approach or a genomics approach, um, you know, some of it is a, is a question of, um, you know, fine tuning some of the timelines, some of the processes. Uh, but, but you know, there's, there's nothing to say that this business is not scalable and you couldn't be analyzing, you know, multiple uh, biological processes uh, as I've described here and as we have with partnerships going forward. We have a highly experienced and good management team. You know, some of the uh, uh, original people at eTherapeutics have been here for a long time. They're you know, experts in the field of computational biology and uh, uh, drug discovery. Uh, I've added some drug development expertise and financial markets. So we think we have a very good team. Um, and really how we maximize the value of our platform is two ways, uh, through partnerships and using some of the best data uh, that we generate for internal drug discovery. We are in active PD discussion and the current partnerships include uh, MSD and Nova Nordisk. Thank you very much indeed, Ali. Um, we've got a number of different questions here. I think the first one I'm going to ask you um, is probably from a shareholder by the uh, um, by the nature of it. Um, is COVID affecting your collaboration with Novo Nordisk? Um, and can you compare yourself to Extensia and your colleagues from South Oxford? Um, you know, I mean, I think if any business is well suited to uh, the horrendous lockdown scenario, it's uh, an informatics business. Um, you know, the physical part of our business is, as I said, shipping the compounds, but that's not insurmountable. There is disruption, but it's pretty minimal, to be honest. Um, you know, we've conducted, you know, a lot, a lot of a lot of things maybe we wouldn't have been able to achieve in an office environment. So I would say net net the answer is you know, a dishonorable draw in the current situation. Um, in terms of ex scientia, um, so if you can imagine that we stop our process at the uh, the the, the small number of compounds, 200 to 1,000 compounds. They go to the phenotypic screens of our, of our, of our uh, partners. Um, they generate hits. Uh, at that stage, we give the compounds, either they use them and we get milestone payments, or we don't. Uh, we haven't scored in their systems in the phenotypic screen. Where XINC are coming to it is they can take a hit uh, that we can generate and progress it further down the chain into what's called medicinal chemistry. Uh, so further optimizing the drug-like properties of the hits we create. Um, and uh, it's just a little different part of the process. Okay, um, looking at your share price so far this year, it's been going gangbusters. Um, do you feel you have realistically a place in battling the coronavirus? Is that what that's all about? Um, I don't know how it correlates to the share price, but. Uh, well, I think we put out, uh, you know, a fairly honest and upfront uh, announcement. I think our, I think our network system is is, is suited um, for the coronavirus. So, in terms of drug interventions, you know, there's a lot of attention being given to antivirals, um, you know, as, as there should be, etc. But you know, we we are concentrating on what's called the kind of host mechanism, where we try and uh, where we try and, uh, you know disrupt the virus's ability to be able to hijack uh, a cell of the host. Um, so, you know, we felt that uh, we really have something to add there. Um, it's a two-pronged strategy. The first one is, you know, in some ways, I don't think we're going to make any money out of it because it will be repurposing drugs. So we've uh, used our analytics approach to look at current available drugs and, you know, if they progress, there's not a possibility of e-therapeutics making it. Um, money out of those drugs and I wouldn't want to do that in any case. Um, but you know, that would obviously amplify our informatics offering. Um, and in terms of what we call new chemical entities, that's something uh, uh, for the future. But also remember, we, we did have some uh, compounds in um, infectious diseases, which were kind of sitting on the shelf, which we knew were already active um, in a kind of inflammatory uh, dampening way, if you like. Um, so it's not quite we started from a blank sheet of paper. 
Okay, um, question here. How many phase two um, clinical trials has ETX conducted? Did any of those then lead on to a phase three program undertaken by another organization? Um, hmm, that's a bit before my time. I think the answer to both is none. Um, I think what's being described there is, um, you know, I would say the era, of, let's call it computational biology, has really only come about in the last, last few years because of computational power, cloud computing, uh, access to databases, machine learning. Uh, and there was a period of time where a lot of companies like eTherapeutics really just didn't have a business model in some ways. So what was happening is they were using their own informatics for their own drug development, which is not in itself a, a bad idea. But, uh, you know, I think the, if you like, the hardware and the software and the infrastructure wasn't quite there, especially the data, to be able to, uh, to even think about other strategies. Next one I've got here, and are you able to quantify savings to a pharma company in terms of time and cost using the ETX platform um, in that narrowing down those hits, narrowing down those compounds, um, sorry, achieving the hits, narrowing down the compounds? Are you able to kind of put it into a, um, a, a time and, and, and cost value in that pitch process or in that relationship? Uh, I mean, it's so variable depending on which phenotypic assay, which process, which, which indication. Uh, to be honest, they're not very liberal with their uh, with their times and costs. But you know, just take the ballpark headline numbers that I've given you in terms of the number of um, the number of compounds that need to be screened. And you know, in part that was a bit of an underestimation. Think about the robotics uh, and, and the kind of high throughput screening systems you need to do that. Think about the hit rates, which are very very small. And then think lastly is even with a hit, you've got to go all the way back and try and Retangle the kind of what's you know how did this compound have an activity? Um, so I would say it's substantial. Uh, one of the things I'm happy about coming in is the the incoming, if you like, interest um, has given me a lot more confidence that there is a product here which is filling a need. Let's just put it that way. And, and the final question, if I may, um, when could investors expect to see significant cash flows um, into eTherapeutics? Ah, cash flows. <laughs> this is a biotechnology company. We're not, we're not allowed to ask those questions. Um, that's a very difficult question to answer. In terms of cash flows, you mean? It, well, I mean, I, I can kind of answer that. If, if it was this was a pure informatics model, that would be easier to, to model, if you like, um, because you know then there's a question of time, cost, volume, and things like that. Uh, where things get complicated is if you have your own discovery programs, which I think in very, very select areas where we think we've got, you know, very, very compelling informatics data and where we think we can partner early, um, you know, that does complicate the cash flow. It's not an easy, it's not, it's not an easy question to answer today anyway.